see. Um, again, thanks for being here for the Griller uh, Symposium on Race and Equity and Philosophy for Children. Our keynote speaker this afternoon is Dr. Zeus Leonardo. He's a professor of education um, and soon be associate dean uh, at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, his work bridges philosophy, cultural studies, and education, and it's devoted to, and I got this from the back of one of his books, uh, the idea that educational knowledge should promote the democratization of schools and society. That's from the back of his book, Race Frameworks, a multidimensional theory of racism in education. He also has many other books. So some of them are Race, Whiteness, and Education, The Handbook of Cultural Politics and Education, Ideology, Discourse, and School Reform, edited books that include Critical Pedagogy and Race, and Charting New Trains of Chicano-Latino Education. Some of his essay titles include things like Critical Social Theory and Transformative Knowledge, The Souls of White Folk, The Color of Supremacy, and in the, I'm excited about this, in the new uh, Discrit, Disability Critical Studies uh, Space, Smartness as Property, a Critical Exploration of Intersections Between Whiteness and Disability Studies. I can't wait to read it now. Um, I'm really grateful to have Zeus here. He's also a good friend of mine, so it's even better than just having a regular speaker in. Um, his talk today is Children as Amateur Intellectuals, Edward Said and the Reconstruction of Authority. Please join me in welcome. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, as, as Sarah mentioned, um, we are dear friends, and uh, I do have a personal connection with Seattle. I, I think you can hear me, right? Yeah. I uh, was here as a visiting professor in uh, 2005, so I spent a year here in Seattle, lived on Queen Anne in an apartment. Uh, my second daughter, my second child, my daughter was born in Seattle, so she's a, she's a husky, as you might say. And so, thank you for inviting me to this uh, symposium participate all day in a conference on philosophy for children, or P for C. Um, so thank you, Sarah, and uh, the uh, Gerler family for uh, supporting this this day, and uh, the colleagues, both in education, that I had a nice opportunity to uh, reminisce and uh, have a reunion with, as well as new friends uh, in philosophy and other, other departments. So anyway, just thank you all for coming and uh, for engaging in the difficult, sometimes, questions we, we need to ask about uh, our schools and our society. So uh, just as a sort of way into the topic, uh, maybe a little, a couple minutes of autobiographical and intellectual notes about myself. So um, I am in the Graduate School of Education, so I, I call it my hat. I wear a hat in education, but I, I wear a visor in the, the critical theory designated emphasis, which is a, you know, something like three dozen disciplines across campus uh, that participate in that, and some of the usual suspects you might know, Judith Butler, Marty J, etc. Um, I've been doing work mainly around um, race and class with a particular uh, interest in whiteness studies. Um, so you'll hear some of that inflected today, but I'm a sort of a traveler, and that's sort of Saeed's uh, term that I'm borrowing. I'm a traveler among the disciplines, so I'm, I'm comfortable with at least, let's say, uh, half a dozen disciplines that I, that I visit uh, regularly, uh, from sociology to philosophy, um, name it, political science, etc. Uh, literature, for today, for example, uh, with Said's work. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable, uh, with, but I'm also a traveler, so I don't really, I'm not a paradigmatic thinker. What I mean by that is, I don't have a gospel. I don't have a paradigm through which I work. I call, maybe in the book that she mentioned, Race Frameworks, I visit the, the four seasons uh, of, of uh, critical race theory, uh, Marxism. I uh, also visit uh, whiteness studies and cultural studies, or what sometimes is called post-foundational thought, right, which includes postmodernism. So I, I don't consider myself a paradigmatic thinker, but I do, con I, I have, certain investments and commitments to certain issues. Uh, one of them, obviously, that I'm going to talk about today are, are uh, issues of race, racism, um, etc. So that's just a way into how I um, think of myself, for example. Now, it's interesting that this conference is about uh, philosophy for children. 
So in education, that's interesting to me because um, sometimes they work quite separately, right? So in education, um, I come from John Dewey's uh, discipline in some sense. So it was nice to have a prominent, global, globally prominent philosopher care about education, care about schooling, and somewhere in there, I hope, also cared about children, because you don't have to necessarily <laughs> care about them if you care about schooling. And so but the other side is education has been uh, at least implicitly about children. And we have lots of work from Piaget, the psychologist, etc., who focus on children. But together, philosophy and children don't sometimes come together. Right? Um, they did in some people. I think probably the best example I might have for you today is, is Rousseau, right? his book Emile, which was uh, sort of uh, uh, his romantic ideas about uh, education for this, this sort of fictive uh, person named Emile. But even there, I'm not sure it was philosophy for Emile, in a sense that it was philosophy for Emile as a gift for Emile, but not Emile himself. Or, uh, themselves. Sometimes I'll, I'll use pronouns in the plural, uh, they, them, there, as singular. Um, but uh, certainly that Emile wasn't clearly a philosopher, so it was philosophy for him or about him or them, etc. Now this was quickly taken up, for example, by G. Stanley Hall. So then we had an education, what we call child study, right? or the creation of childhood, if anything. The creation and invention, invention of childhood. So anyway, that's why I'm interested in talking to you today about um, philosophy and children, particularly sort of inflected by my disciplinary background in education, but really as I travel among the seasons of disciplines and, and, and uh, paradigms. Um, what I'm also interested in is, as the title might suggest, um, looking at children as amateur intellectuals. Uh, I get this from Said's representation of intellectuals. And I'll give you more background on that, obviously. Now that's strategic for a couple of reasons. One, that children are, in, in some cases, really amateurs. That they are neophytes, that they are new to this. And so I think that that's sort of an advantage is to think of them as amateur intellectuals in the way Said might look at it. Right? But I also think of it in a sense of how can we take them, even as adults. So this is not just philosophy for children, children as philosophers, but I also am influenced, I'm writing a book on Said, so look for that in about a year. <laughs> uh, I'm interested also in questions, uh, so, so three concepts I play around with in Said are uh, the intellectual, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna present that to you today. Uh, another one is on the exile, I presented that yesterday one or two people from that talk at Seattle U. Um, the other one is contrapuntal analysis. And um, I, I won't spend too much time on uh, contrapuntality or exile, but one of my points about exile is even if you're not in a traditional sense an exile, can you take the position of the exile? Right? So that to Said, um, one can take the intellectual political position of the exile without necessarily being the traditional exile, right? And so from that, you know, you have in art and in literature, James Joyce, right? Um, I will mention Hemingway, uh, Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness. Among others, Auerbach, uh, Eric Auerbach, the book, uh, the book My Mises. Uh, he literally was an exile, a German-Jewish exile, uh, one of Said's favorites. But he, so he considered exile as a more general, human, global phenomenon of how people are displaced. Right? People are displaced. And not just what I call at the end of the barrel of a gun, for example, which is the traditional exile. And so some of this is also my interest in Paulo Freire. So Paulo Freire was early on a very important part of my thinking. Is that me doing that? Um, I know. Some of you know that Paolo Freire was exiled at the, basically at the end of a barrel of a gun, and he left for 16 years and uh, traveled the world. And he wrote about his exile. So the idea of children as amateur intellectuals is not just can we look at children as intellectuals, and that's sort of my proxy for philosopher, but can we sometimes as adults like taking the position of the exile? Can we see ourselves as children, as children see us? Can we? I also come from a literature background in the past. 
can we be Frankensteinian? Right? To the extent that Frankenstein's monster, um, it's not the Hollywood version, by the way. Frankenstein is not the monster. Frankenstein is the doctor. Can we, and if you've ever read that beautiful book, uh, you know how intellectual and philosophical the monster is. But also, as a child, the monster is, in a sense, this innocent, this innocent romantic child that uh, Dr. Frankenstein uh, and Dan gives birth to. So can we, as adults, sometimes take the position of the child? is also one of my interests in this. So not just children as philosophers, but philosophers as, ch as children. Not that way. I know that <laughs> sometimes uh, scholars can act childish and, 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 uh, and fight over uh, sometimes uh, scarce resources. That's not, that's not me. So that's, those are my interests, and that's how I'm going to come into this topic. But let me begin. Luckily, we have some time, because I'm used to going to AERA, my own conference. You have 12 to 14 minutes. So. Um, it's nice to have a little more. So part of it is, if you, um, some of you know that, uh, um, so this is my presentation structure. I have roughly three parts. I, I tried to be a little playful. That's from my, that's from my literary background. Um, posting up on colonialism, representing the intellectual, and the post and post color blindness is not the same as the post and post colonialism. So I'm gonna end today with some commentaries on our current racialized situation, and particularly racialized speech, right? And how we're transitioning, I'm arguing, into a different regime of racial speech. All right, let me begin. So, so Antonio Gramsci, some of you who know him as the Italian Marxist, once argued that everyone is potential, an intellectual by function, in addition to being an intellectual by vocation. Taking this suggestion broadly, this presentation expands Gramsci's definition by including children as young intellectuals. So for this talk, I take my cue from Edward Said's representation of the intellectual, that decades after Gramsci, Said intervenes with his own reconstruction of the intellectual, the problem of expertise, and nature of authority. So I have a little slash there. Inaugurated arguably by his text, Orientalism, developed in the book Representations of the Intellectual, and then refined throughout his long and prolific career. Saeed's representation of the intellectual is relevant for young people who enter philosophical discourse as amateurs in both the chronological, i.e. age, and positional sense. Framing the intellectual as the incarnation of expertise was central to the imperial project of Orientalist discourse. Again, framing the intellectual as the incarnation of expertise was central to Orientalism. This Western orientation must now be disoriented, is his argument in mind, which leads Said to argue that as a class, intellectuals are, quote unquote, badly in need today of moral rehabilitation and social redefinition, close quote. As a result, it is necessary to put a wedge between the intellectual and expert knowledge in order to avoid the temptation to transform a certain will to knowledge into a will to dominate others. Young people are a strategic place to, to test Said's theory of the amateur as they enter the practice of philosophy and public life as neophytes. As amateurs, young people embody Said's preference for knowledge as a project forged by novices embarking on representation as a non-impositional practice through what he calls secular criticism and for him, say, uh, for Said, secular um, and its opposite religious is not always about religion as an institution per se, it's about the notion that certain knowledges are sacred. Right? Canonization, for example, is a religious way of looking at knowledge. He would prefer us to go towards secularism. Widely known for his breakout text, Orientalism, where, Said's, uh, where Said studies the cultural apparatus of colonialism, to argue that the Occident, or Europe, controls the Orient by disciplining the knowledge that allows us to apprehend Orients, the Orient's people and traditions, Said is the veritable founder of post-colonial literary criticism. Now, if you are not familiar with Said, the Orient for him was the near, near East, or the Middle East. Later on, he does take up the Far East, which is often uh, what, what we're familiar with when we say Orient, Orientalism, etc. 
the, the, in the beginning when he wrote Orientalism, it's Ox the Occident or Europe's relationship with the Middle East. Right? So, but before I begin this in earnest, uh, we might want to understand what the post and post-colonialism mean. And this is the post posting up on colonialism. So, as you know, the, the, the prefix post is, is a very popular academic uh, term. Uh, in fact, if you can create a term or a phrase that includes post, you've got a career ahead of you. Right? So the most uh, popular one that we probably know is postmodern theory, postmodernism. But it doesn't stop there. There's postcolonialism, there's postpragmatism with uh, Rorty, the philosopher. Right? There's postfeminism with Camille Paglia. Right? There's post race theory. You just have to watch Bill O'Reilly on that one. Um, there's post Freirian thought. Now that one's a little more chronological since Freire's death in 1997. So I'm going to deduce a couple. Uh, ways to in to the word post. Patty Lather, in my own discipline, uh, suggests there's post critical to the extent that the guarantees of critical thinking, critical theory in particular, are starting to uh, wear on her as a post structural feminist. So there's a lot of post. Uh, there's even, I remember, a uh, book series from Stanford University Press called the, the book series of post contemporary thought. So even the present can never be with itself. It's outrunning itself. Most often, we think of post in the temporal sense. Um, most often, we think of post in the post uh, in the in the temporal sense, such that um, you have the. You know, I'm from the Bay Area, uh, and our team is the Warriors. So there's the post post game show after the Warriors. Um, there's also what I play, uh, sort of playfully call the post Michael era. Right, after the death of Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, and the Russian Michael Gorbachev, or at least his fall from power. Uh, is Michel Foucault, or uh, is Michel the French for Michael? I'm not sure. He might be a fourth Michael then. So we live in the post-Michael era, sort of chronologically speaking. It's, but it's becoming quite what I call post-humorous. Post so it would be accurate to say that, by and large, administrative, occupational, or official colonialism is now in the rear view mirror, or the after of colonial administration worldwide. You have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. You know, as Linda, Linda Smith uh, cites, I think uh, an, an author named Sykes, uh, who was asked, you know, what do you think about post-colonialism? He said, oh, have they left? <laughs> so again. It could be looked at as chronological, and it would it would make some sense. I think that you can talk about this as the post-colonial world in the chronological sense of much of the administrative colonialism have have, have, have been toppled. But that's only one way to look at it. So, but far from the irrelevance of colonialism in post-colonialism, the post in post-colonialism signifies a new analytic place. So, I'm thinking of post as a place where from where to understand the continuing effects of colonialism. In other words, post is equally interesting as a spatial in addition to temporal turn within social criticism. Just as a postal carrier travels from place to place to deliver mail, post is a metaphor whose etymology is traceable to the Greek word fora, or the agent or bearer of moving something from one location to another, i.e. metaphor, metaphor including the transfer of meaning and meta, meta, the Greek for beyond. So in a sense, even um, post itself becomes a metaphor. It is part of meta and fora, or the agent of moving something from one location to another, or to transcend. For Nietzsche, for example, truth may be described as worn-out metaphors. Likewise, post-colonialism transports our analysis beyond a strictly material military and money analysis of the colonial enterprise by turning our gaze toward its cultural copy. And this is Saeed. Like the Australian outpost, for example, that marks the transition from urban to the bush, or light and electrical posts um, that help us navigate the drive home. Sometimes, for example, if you look at a track neighborhood, all the houses quite look alike, and you're going to have to sort of mark yourself as... Uh, that's what that happened to me when I moved into Alameda of, of the Bay Area. The houses all looked the same, and it was easier to get lost. But I would look for that post to sort of mark my way home. 
So post marks that post marks the spot that facilitates what Said elsewhere calls traveling theory. So Said's innovation marks a new theoretical space, the post, from where we stand to survey the territory of colonial analysis, this time as a cultural relation, and not in the expert way inaugurated by Orientalism. To pursue the sports analogy once again, just as a forward on a basketball team, right, there's two guards, a center, and two forwards on a basketball team. Just as a, a forward on a basketball team frequently takes his position in offense by posting up, right, post-colonial intell intellectuals place us on a particular coordinate on the grid of interpretation consisting of different discursive moves to settle the score with colonialism. Finally, just as we post comments on Facebook, which I'm not on, I'm not on Facebook, <laughs> and other social media outlets, post-colonial commentary inserts itself into a conversation in media threats or in the middle of it, and alters our terms of engagement with the topic of colonialism. In this sense, post is an action, such as posting up, or a verb, to indicate movement from one intellectual place to another. In all, post is a presupposition as much as it is a prefix. That is, with culture, representation, and knowledge as constitutive of the colonial project. I'm going to put that there for now. So, therefore, and sometimes called accredited with say, post colonial analysis does not signal a break from anti colonial analysis as much as it is a shift or transfer in explaining its processes. Said is concerned with the same col colonialism that provided Fanon and Césaire, their problematic or their concern. But Said's is a colonial predicament turned into a literary phenomenon, what in another talk I call the turn from military canons to literary canons. Its brutality is not only its capacity to turn targets of colonialism into non-beings, as Fanon once insisted, but equally their disfigurement through metaphor and other practices. That is, the worldliness of language, for example, means that enunciation cannot be divorced from the earthliness that interpolates it. Disfiguration happens when the Oriental's knowledge, and I'm going to use Orientals in a sort of more or less neutral way to describe people from the Orient, because right in other places, Orient, Oriental is a slope. Um, so that disfiguration happens when the Oriental's knowledge is perversely consumed as objects in the Orientalist industry, knowledge industry, and ignorance ironically asserts itself as the only legitimate form of knowledge. That is, with race and power in the analytical picture, ignorance and knowledge, rather than being philosophical opposites, are pushed closer together, fused within the heat and dynamics of colonialism when the colonizer's ignorance is knowledge. You might recognize this philosopher, Charles Mills, and I'll let you read it. Right, so part of this is, the other thing I wanted to mention in the beginning when one talks about philosophy and children in the sense that both philosophy and children are racialized, right? And if you don't have to read too much of Charles Mills and people like Lewis Gordon, uh, Paul Taylor, and other philosophers of race, uh, where they indict philosophy, their own discipline, for A, its paucity of black representation, i.e., right? Philosophy uh, of race, and black self representation, i.e., black philosophers. So that philosophy is itself a racialized discipline. But also children. You can't talk to me too long about children without that being a racialized concept. Um, we have lots of stories of young black men who are really, um, ultimately, children. I mean, we're talking about 14-year-olds who are in danger on the streets. So when we're talking about philosophy for children, both philosophy and children, I'm suggesting here, are racialized concepts. And this is one piece. Uh, by the way, all of that is italicized. And the only um, non-italicized word there is knowledge. That's, that's correctly the way you get it. So you kind of did it backwards as, as, as we, we might be more used to. So turning ignorance into knowledge is the modus operandi of, of Orientalist expertise. 
demoting other ways of comprehending the world as subjugated forms of knowledge, superstition or otherwise, what William Appleman Williams calls empire as a way of life. So what happens here is that colonialism at once was a power that was administered, is now a sort of social condition of coloniality, right? That is lying in wait for um, people from all over the world, even voluntary immigrants in that phrase that John Agu uh, used to like to use, right? So that even uh, voluntary immigrants, not those people who are necessarily refugees, themselves are walking into a colonial situation. And I think that uh, we can talk about the U.S. as one of those places. And that doesn't make the U.S., um, it doesn't indict the U.S. as a, as a terrible place to be in fact, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm patriotic in some other ways to this country. It, um, so what happens is, is yeah. next we want to talk about representations of the intellectual. So that in criticism, was it a, this, uh, whether literary, philosophical, or educational, there has been an historical attention to the role and function of the intellectual. Among the left, it's quite popular to. To, to look at theories of, of the intellectual, but the left doesn't have a monopoly on this. Uh, this is a cursory look of some of the inventory uh, and their proponents of theories of the intellectual. It's not exhaustive. You don't see Habermas there. You won't. You don't see um, Russell Jacobi, etc. But they're, they're in my head. So I mean, the popular one that you that you've heard of is the vanguard idea of the intellectual, right? Uh, this is from Lenin, not John Lenin, but the other Lenin. Uh, the talented tenth was Du Bois's own. Right? The, the, the organic intellectual, as I mentioned, was Gramsci's, with the, the idea that is against the traditional intellectual, which is a vocation, which uh, often on the left, they considered the traditional intellectual as in cahoots with power. And so it was Gramsci's task to reconstruct the intellectual as everybody is potentially an intellectual. Right? So Cesar Chavez, who has, I don't think, a high school degree, is an intellectual, for example. The specific intellectual is Foucault's answer, which he suggests you, uh, that the intellectual can no longer represent others. So rather than a general intellectual, we have here the specific intellectual. The native intellectual is the de decolonial intellectual, to put it in another way. That's Fanon. The dialogical intellectual is the one from Bakhtin, known for his concept of uh, carnival. Uh, the, the heteroglossia, so the idea of the dialogical intellectual is always, in some sense, a space of conversation. Uh, teachers as transformative intellectuals is Giroux's appropriation of, of Gramsci. Uh, border intellectuals, some Anzaldúa, uh, I think the term in some of the critical theory language in, in, is to work in the in, interstices, I think is the word for it, but I believe she calls it Nepantla, to work in Nepantla. And, uh, I think um, the book you threw out earlier about the fence captures this, about friendships, relationships, even thinking and philosophizing at the border. Both literally, because uh, Anzaldúa did live near the borders of Mexico and the U.S., but it's a metaphor and a mindset of how to think about life in the Nepatla. And Giroud and McLaren took this and they called it border pedagogy. Black feminist intellectual that uh, many people are familiar with, with Patricia Hill, Collins. Black British intellectuals in the history of that by Paul Warmington in the UK. And uh, I actually, I won't claim to coin it, but I actually am the one who used orgiastic intellectual as a, an alliteration to organic intellectual, but I take it through Bataille and Baudrillard, the postmodernists, um, they're looking at the intellectual as not productive, as in the Marxist intellectual, who is right, focused on production, productive, even meaning is supposed to be productive, but they were looking at waste, expenditure, right? If you've read Marcel Moss, the anthropologist, he has a book called The Gift, and it was about how Aust uh, Australasian, Melanesian societies cannot be explained by Marxism because they work, their economy is through symbolic exchange of waste and expenditure. And Baudrillard and Bataille take this framework from Moss, Marcel Moss, who was Durkheim's nephew, by the way, uh, who carried uh, French anthropology for a while um, through this book, The Gift. It's a wonderful book. Yeah. And Derrida took it. He talked about language as a gift, for example. And so orgiastic there is not as 
um, lascivious or salacious as it sounds. It's, it's, a, it's a term to describe waste and expenditure rather than um, its more sexual connotations. Sorry. So I do not have the space to go over all these intellectual uh, theories, but for his part, Said offers his reconstruction of the intellectual as Nabi to counter the focus on competence and authority that has marked the intellectual from Lenin and on. And interestingly, when he came up with this theory, one of the Orientalists, actually, so that was a title. Orient Orientalist is a person who studies an area, usually in the Middle East. So it wasn't necessarily a slur. In fact, in some ways, Said is an Orientalist. He studies the Middle East. So it's, on one hand, a neutral descriptor of what you do. But I think because he gave it such a gloss in Orientalism, that Orientalist beco has become a little bit of a pejorative word. Right? And interestingly, when he came out with his notion of the intellectual as novice, as amateur, as non-expert, Bernard Lewis, an Orientalist from the UK, quickly questioned, I don't know if you noticed it, but quickly questioned Saeed's expertise. Like, what do you know about area studies? You're not really an area scholar. And so it's kind of ironic that he, uh, that's exactly what Saeed was talking about, is this notion of expertise and authority that scholars often rely on. Now, we rely on it for different reasons. I wouldn't suggest that it's, it's not important to have expertise or even to speak as an expert, particularly for marginalized people, people of color, women. I think it would be hard to sit up here for you to look at me and say, oh, he's not an expert. I think that there are some dangers in uh, going too far with the notion of not having expertise and experts. Some of us rely on being regarded as experts and having expertise. Nevertheless, I think what Said is doing is a principled attack on expertise as part of cultural colonial domination, of how the Occident and European scholars went to the Orient and basically through knowledge control, through controlling the production of knowledge about the area, were able to then signify, right, represent, which is part of controlling the Orient. Right? It basically invented the Orient. Now you and I might say, well, no, it's a place. Yes, of course it's a place, but it's a place of meaning. And what did it mean for the Occident to basically consume the Orient through knowledge production? Right, so these uh, great uh, thinkers, uh, Said's concern was uh, maybe distilled as a wariness with the fetish of expertise that defines the intellectual as a guardian of tradition, the sort of the Matthew Arnold culture or anarchy explanation, and criticism as the practice of great thinkers, uh, quote unquote, whose ideas warrant canonization. So this is what he was worried about. These figures here in front of you and their ideas are cataloged under the aegis of what Matthew Arnold again once called culture with a big C, or the best that a society has produced, opposite to its complementarity, that is, anarchy. So the book is called Culture and Anarchy. Said insists that the intellectual's amateur works against the grain of literary tradition as part of a longer history of imperialism. It does not deny the amateur intellectual claims to having some kind of expertise, as I mentioned. It would be a little too dangerous to go that far. But vacates, he vacates the will to dominate others through superior vision, or what I call supervision. And that word actually means something in education. Um, usually you have a supervising teacher, for example. Supervision, sort of Foucauldian uh, questions uh, about enlightenment. So superior, superior vision and originator of meaning that has become the cult of expertise in much of academic life. So against the religiosity of sacred texts, so this is what it means for him to talk about religion, Said's move towards secular criticism attempts to dismantle the dominatory tradition of intellectual work that is the hallmark of Orientalist discourse and other modern imperialist projects including its favorite association with the intellectual. So influenced by the Foucault of Discipline and Punish, Orientalism, Said's book, appears on the intellectual scene only a few years later. Early on in what became a long and distinguished career, Said casts aspersions on the disciplinary functions of knowledge, i.e. how, for example, we're talking today about um, transdisciplinary thinking. I, I think of how the discipline's discipline, right? how the disciplines discipline knowledge, how the disciplines discipline you. 
this is dis disciplinary for, uh, functionism knowledge in reproducing power relations between the Occident and Orient, whereby the second is caricatured, reduced, and infantilized through the expertise of the first for its own pleasures and political interests. The upshot is that in addition to military prowess, Europeans are able to dominate the Near East through an educative cultural process. So this is Gramsci, right? Uh, Gramsci considered that the state had a, has an educative function. So this is how I'm thinking of education, which is not reducible to schools or school. In other words, his work suggests that imperialism is one, again, one part military canons, one part literary canons. Relying on expertise, the Orientalists' authority is built on the power to be there, to be there physically in the Orient in order to catalog, survey, and define it, and by doing so, construct the Orient as a weak mimesis of Europe. In the Orientalist perspective, quote, the Orient is not at all a place where modern Orientals live, work, produce. It is a cocoon cloistered away from the real modern world. In the U.S., okay, here's something I wanted to mention, you know, in education, for example, how do you bring Said's Orientalism into education? So if Orientalism was an industry of knowledge that produced how we should know, how we should know, so knowing here is a will to know, a sort of power-knowledge relationship, as Foucault would say. In education, we talk a lot about urban students, right, at-risk students, etc. And you, if you look at... Um, the mass of literature on urban families, urban education, urban students, you will find that a lot of the authors, the prominent ones, are white educators. So I might be tempted to call that urban orientalism that's happening in education. So that's, how, that's one way you might want to bring the methodology of orientalism to talk about education. Who controls how families of color, how children of color, how children's cultural competence, for example, are, are going to be understood? Right? And often we call that the deficit often we call that the deficit perspective on children of color. I call that urban orientalism. And if you remember that book by Robin Kelly, uh, it's called actually it's a nice title, Your Mama's Dysfunction. Um, it was his way to talk back to the urban wars of the eighties, right? Uh, which preceded the cultural wars of the nineties, of how uh, the Moynihan report earlier, in earlier decades, were able, uh, was able to uh, influence our, our thinking about what the black and Latino family structure was. And it was a very culture of poverty argument about them. And so Kelly writes this, this, this nice book, which says basically, you know, i.e., we're not dysfunctional, your, your mama's dysfunctional, which is the notion of playing dozens in black cultural practices, right? Of, of taking, you know, the opponent to task and taking and I'm dressing him down with, with these insults. But it was always about play. And what Kelly is saying is, this is you're not playing anymore, right? The Moynihan uh, Glazer Report, for example, and a whole host of sociological treatises about urban life, uh, particularly about total blacks. So for Said, this intellectual practice is not characterized by apprehending a truth that never arrives, but asking what kind of work our representations do and accomplish in the world because it does not hear his quote, it does not finally matter who wrote what, but rather how a work is written and how it is read, close quote. So here, I'm gonna step into, right, this last one, oh, right, so I'm gonna step into this part, and I'm gonna premise it by, what are the challenges to forging an intellectual culture with children in an atmosphere many would call anti-intellectual? And I'm speaking here of the recent uh, election of Trump and the turn towards anti-intellectualism. But this problem notwithstanding, I'm hesitating to give into the temptation of calling Trump an anti-intellectual, since this move is libel, and this is what Sarah kind of gestured towards when, I, when she talked about my essay with Alicia Braddock on smartness as property. Because to call him an anti-intellectual, is liable to reify ossified notions of what Roderick and I have called smartness as property within the ableist dichotomies of quote unquote smart and dumb, bright and dim, intelligent and cognitively challenged, or in this way, intellectual and anti-intellectual. 
So I prefer to say that Trump's, I don't have any problems if you want to call him things intellectual, but I'm making a different point here. I prefer, that, I prefer to say that Trump's persona summons, summons more or less the traditional white male bourgeois authoritarian entitlements to intellectual life and expertise, rather than it confirming a certain anti-intellectualism. Against this backdrop, then, I'm using Sain's amateur intellectual as the antipode, if not the antidote. Right, so I, I, I have no problems if you want to call him anti-intellectual, but I think it has a problem in the discrete community that then we're, we're, we're making that divide. That some people really are dumb, some people are really smart. He's dumb, therefore this idea of smart exists out there. That's got problems we know. So I'm gonna say I prefer for this purpose to call him a traditional intellectual that uh, has entitlements of the white bourgeois male. So the post in colorblindness. So the, now I'm gonna step more fully into uh, some of the work I'm doing on post-colorblind race discourse. So the world, it's gonna sound slightly apocalyptic. The world is in a state of crisis, and the US is no exception. If it is, leading, if it is a leading nation of the world, it has not always earned that title for the right reasons. That is, many US citizens question whether the US is leading the world in the wrong direction. With the election of Donald Trump, the US finds itself in a maelstrom of debates deep insecurities and divisions it was by and large surprised by and for which it was unprepared. Trump's election to quote unquote make America great again reinvigorates the old right found in white working class resentment and energizes an apparently new and alternative right dressed in banana republic metro wear. You'll see more why I'm saying this. The interesting word here is again making America great again a nostalgia or return to a past that can only be accomplished with naivete, a time that harkens back to Jim Crow, manifest destiny, and when whites ruled this earth with an iron fist rather than a soft touch. And that's why I think it's so, uh, the other concept of the exile is important for, for Saeed because he considers a return to homeland, a return to the past, as something you can't do without irony. So this idea of returning to a past great America is a problem. And I think that the literature on exile has something to say about that. Yet this new right is not the clan, as satirized by comedian Dave Chappelle in the first episode of this show, featuring Clayton Bixby, the black white supremacist who's blind. If you haven't seen it, please Google it. It's a Stroke of, uh, it's a stroke of art. The alternative right rises out of the confluence of new technologies, such as Twitter, Twitter etc., a newfound confidence in a new politician president they consider a card carrying member of the club, even if he disavows them on occasion. Right, so Trump does sometimes distance himself from the alt right and claims nothing about them, but he clearly inspires them. This critical moment represents at once the conservative movement's triumphalist cry, as well as the right's desperate move to recapture the greatness of that endangered empire known as the US. I'm gonna do a little more with the word desperate and desperation. I think you see it there at the bottom of the slide. It is indeed a dangerous moment in history, uh, US history as part of overall global development. A new era trumpeted by U.S. conservatives whose discourse divides at the same time they profess to heal these set divisions. To anyone observing, it is quite a trick to throw both water and gas at the fire. I call this global because he's not alone. Of course, we have uh, Philippines Duterte as a rough Philippine equivalent, although he has complications. His mother was anti marcos um, but if anyone knows anything about Duterte's death squads and the reports about that and his sort of masculine bluster, uh, you'll see how he's a Marlboro man just like Trump in some ways. And of course, uh, the, the Russian uh, equivalent of uh, Vladimir Putin who wants to make Russia great again. So there's, it's going, it's happening all over the world, this idea of recapturing the Philippines as a gem, an economic gem before Marcos, because the Philippines used to be a much better economy uh, in, 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 in Asia. 
to the new or alt-right, in some respect, an old right. Free speech, for example, becomes the freedom to offend, harass, and threaten already targeted groups such as Muslims and Mexican Americans. This overt or traditional racist language is quite different, if not opposite, of what several social scientists from Bonilla Silva to Bobo and Smith have called colorblind or laissez-faire racism, whereby race is coded, and that's C-O-D-E-D -E and C-O-A-T-E-D, is coded in apparently race-neutral yet knowing wink rhetoric. So as long as you don't use the words black, as long as you don't use the word, you know, Asian, apparently colorblindness, um, you're not talking about race. But we know very well the studies that suggest um, that behavior is there, that policies follow that are very racialized. So we might call the alt-rights race speech a form of what I'm calling, for the lack of a better word for now, post-colorblindness, for its overt references to race. But post-colorblindness differs from Jim Crow, right? So it's Jim Crow, colorblindness, and then post-colorblindness. And I'm saying it's not a return to Jim Crow. It differs from Jim Crow race speech because post-colorblindness does not necessarily claim on an overt level white superior status or any special entitlements coming to them, but merely in some ways asserts whiteness as unique, itself fighting off extinction like any other racial group. So to me, post-colorblindness, A, is overt like Jim Crow, i.e. whites are calling themselves white. In fact, I think what we saw clearly in the Trump campaign is whiteness as an identity politics. And that's very, very different from colorblindness. In fact, part of uh, post-colorblindness uh, is not just to assert white uniqueness and white specificity, but in fact white victimhood. That whites and whiteness are themselves victims of this overgrown identity politics, this liberalism that, let's say, Clinton and uh, Obama can be blamed for. By the way, I, I understand Trump's ascendance as a reaction to eight years of Obama. We can talk about that in another paper. So again, this is important to me, that post-colorblindness, and if you have another phrase to call it better than that, I'm up. This is new thought, this is new thinking of mine, because um, and I am using post here in two, two senses. A, a, it is chronological. It follows colorblindness, like the post game show. But it also is, in another, the other sense I've been talking about, post as a kind of ambivalent stage, an ambivalent space that we're in, trying to make sense of race. So in all, understanding the next stage of public race speech or post colorblindness may be precisely what is awaiting young people, these children as philosophers or what some call the iGen, or the post-millennials. It is precisely what Saeed's intellectual needs to get a handle on, and one wonders what he would have thought of Trump had Saeed lived long enough. Now, with respect to a reinvigorated attack on Muslim, i.e. the registry, and Mexican-Americans, i.e. the wall, this front-stage racism to appropriate Goffman, a sociologist, is deemed acceptable in public places in a way that offends our general mood for Americans regarding narratives about blacks since the Civil Rights Movement. I think that's the victory of the Civil Rights Movement, among others, is that it changed our orientation to speech, racial, racialized speech, in public places. Right? Now, it doesn't mean that private spaces weren't still Jim Crow, but in public places, um, you couldn't say some things without being noticed or without reprisal. Right? And I consider that one of the moral victories of the Civil Rights Movement. Now, this public talk is decidedly not colorblind, i.e., mean, right, post colorblind. Because um, it made it generally unacceptable to free blacks in such light in the public sphere of the post civil rights speech. But apparently, not so for Muslims and Mexicans, right? Because uh, I, I sense that the attack here is overtly on Muslims and Mexicans. I'm not saying it's pro black. But it certainly seemed to um, downplay anti-blackness in public speeches that he's been making. So that this new xenophobia evidence in Trump's campaign and inaugural speech, if you will recall, uh, 
is a particular form of racism that harkens either back to the early 20th century Americanization project, or sometimes resembles more recent, some call hysterical version of alarmist treatments of difference, such as Samuel P. Huntington's Clash of Civilization thesis. A variety of nationalism more common in European contexts, where populist politicians incite fear of immigrants and other non-European groups happening, for example, uh, with Macron's um, um, election, etc. And so some say that Trump, uh, so we used to do, joke that Bill Clinton was our first black president, that's the Toni Morrison article. One might say that Trump is our first European president because he's, he, he's signaling a little more of a sensibility that we, we associate it with European nationalism and fear and xenophobia, etc. That's more common there. In all, racialized speech is going through another transformation in our Trump era, something that dates back at least to the Tea Party's insurgents. It would be overreaching, though, to say that the U.S. is experiencing a shift from neoliberalism to neo-fascism. So there's this talk, like Cornel West has said, we're, neoliberal, we're at the end of neoliberalism, enter neo-fascism. And the reason I'm saying that it's, it might be overreaching right now because the Trump administration still clings onto cert certain central aspects of neoliberalism, such as, for example, uh, as, as we care about in my discipline, the privatization of education in schools, um, such as uh, the Secretary uh, of Education, Bet Betsy DeVos. Right. We are witnessing the, the white lash against eight years of Obama, so I've returned to that, 25 years of multiculturalism, 40 years of affirmative action, and 50 years of civil rights legislation. So DeVos is critical in this analysis, uh, who is a vocal proponent of vouchers, and if you don't already know, part of the billionaire family that owns Amway, and she gestures as much in this direction. Interestingly, the criticism about her, going back to the intellectual as amateur, is she has had almost zero involvement in educational leadership and is put forward by Trump with, with basically expertise. And so that's interesting. It's okay there. Yeah, it's okay there to claim expertise where apparently a lot of people are saying there, there is few or little. And for the first time in several administrations, the presidential cabinet will not consist of any Latinos. Right? George W. Bush had some. Notwithstanding, of course, Devin Nunez's loyalty to Trump. Right? This is the, the Californian. But neither does that matter, since racial and ethnic diversity is a ploy of complaining people, a sign of their weakness anyway. This follows on the heels of racial, racial resentment signaled by the Michigan Affirmative Action case that questioned the use of race considerations in admissions. And our era, um, so if law legal cases are indicative or are iconic of their racial understanding of the time, you could say that Plessy, right? Separate but equal, represented in an iconic way and symbolized in that way its own racial predicament and Brown v. Board represented its own transition into a new racial common sense. You might want to say that there's one afoot, which is the Fisher case in Texas, of how a white woman complained to the University of Texas system that she didn't get into Texas because she's white. You can read on, the cases is still being deliberated, but for example, she forgets to mention that there are a lot of students of color who were who had better scores and grades than she who did not get in. But that's, in a sense, indicative of this post colorblindness, whites as victims of liberal identity politics. And it also speaks to alternative facts, etc. One sense is that white America has had enough of the only several decades old mi minority identity politics, but unable to hide behind the previously opaque veil of whiteness, i.e. colorblindness, or not able to go back to the transparency of racial power of Jim Crow, the Trump election was clearly about the assertion of and possessive investment in white identity politics. Whites not only spoke up by voting, particularly the rural and white working class voters as we know, and surprisingly so white women, but they spoke up as an interest group. Right? They spoke up as white. Well. This is even different from the earlier images of, if you recall, Joe the Plumber, 
from Ohio during Obama's first bid. Because there is at least a universal appeal for Joe as the common, hardworking family man. I don't know if he had a family. I think he did. Uh, and that is precisely <coughs> Joe the Plumber's power and effectiveness. He's universal man. It falls within the discursive repertoire of colorblindness. But now, Joe's whiteness is surely an issue. Indeed, a weapon for the right. So for this reason, the shift in race discourse towards post-colorblindness is not simply a return to a previous white chauvinism disguised as universal humanism. The Trump, the Trump alt-right and, Bright, and Breitbart triumvirate is precisely the appropriation of decades of leftist identity politics and deployment of its very logic for the purposes of white nationalism as a white project. I go a little bit into gender. I see that it's 20 minutes to. I go into gender because, as Jackson Katz, our good friend, uh, whose work, whose good work on gender, uh, suggests that gender is never not in play, especially in the presidential campaigns. That gender and masculinity are always in play in presidential campaigns, especially this return of the conceit, the literary conceit of the cuck, the cuckolding, right? If you, I think if you read Dryden, the playwright, there's a good play on the cuck. So the literary conceit of the cuck at once a reference to the cuckoo bird's habit of laying eggs in another bird's nest, and a man cuckolded by his woman partner's infidelity. This speaks to the felt emasculation of a conservative understanding of white masculinity that must now reclaim its proper place if the U.S. is to grow some hair on its global chest. Even new conservatism under the likes of Mitt Romney or Marco Rubio may be perceived as emasculating. As conservatives, establishment Republicans are derided as effeminate politicians who do not possess the appropriate endowment to stem the wide of complaining Americans, those immigrants, feminists, and identitarians in general. To these true conservatives, it is time for the right to man up and assert its manhood against what it considers the sorry other from Democrats to those without documents, to NATO and the new left, and Muslims and Marxists. Enter Donald Trump, who succeeds in grabbing the right's imagination and prides himself for not pussyfooting around. Inaugurating Saeed's intellectual is not without its challenges in ending him. In that era of hyper-authoritarianism, in the ironic assertion of expertise, in the context of alt-facts and post-truths. It is tempting to call Trump the first postmodern president in the vein of a hyper-real leader, so that this is Baudrillard, with which Baudrillard would have had a field day. The threats to education and Trump's use of flagrant misogyny, racism, and xenophobia are already clear to some of us. Amidst this retreat and threat from civil rights and democratic institutions, the university, public in particular, such as UW, sits in the uncomfortable position of promoting cherished notions of academic freedom, freedom of speech, indeed, freedom of thought, within what I might call desperate white supremacy. I'm going to end there. I have a bit more that I wanted to talk about with Milo Yiannopoulos, and I know he visited here under the tour. He call himself calls the dangerous faggot tour. That's his phrase. I wanted to talk about that. That's what I earlier called um, the banana republic metro wear of the new right. Um, but I wanted to end with a slightly greener argument, or it's greener on the other side here, that there's a lot of talk that this is a victory for the right or the alt-right, but I don't want to underestimate that this is also showing the desperate side of white supremacy, that it has to, ha and this is sort of a platonic um, image, it had to come out of the bright cave of whiteness as white. Because for too long and for very long, white and whiteness had to hide behind a darker cave of whiteness. But now it has had to come out there. And I call that part of the desperation or the desperate stage of white supremacy. And that really kind of uh, compromises what is otherwise, but some people are rightfully so calling this a victory for white nationalism, white chauvinism, and nativism. But I, I want to end a little bit on this note of this is also showing some of its desperateness and desperation. So um, we need the intellectual through Saeed's work as, 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 as a novice, as a non-expert, as some sort of antipode and antidote to this new era where 
uh, authoritarianism is on the rise. Thank you. That's not bad. We still have some time. So. So curriculum aside, but philosophy is also suffering the same thing. I'm 
But the silver lining is maybe we ought to look for philosophy in not the same places of, let's say, analytic philosophy or even continental philosophy. Maybe critical race theory is the back door to philosophy in education. I certainly am bringing philosophy into a critical race study in education. So that's what I see as trendy because partly the standardized movement is making reading the three R's, right? It's making reading, particularly reading and math scores, so important that foundational disciplines such as philosophy, um, curriculum studies, are becoming really um, secondary to get your scores up. It's easy, that's, and that's starting to drive research. So that's what I see is happening. Um, obviously, um, up for the fight, and we're doing good work, and I think we have to be creative, we have to be innovative. I don't, I'm a Freudian, but I don't like to look back to the 90s as the great Freudian decade. You know, we live in post follow Freudy, and I'm willing to, you know, leave the house, leave home, and see where else I can go. And since Saeed is one way for me to do it. Um, of writing this book. It's the first book, I believe, on Saeed and education. There's an edited book on Saeed. And this book. So I'm trying to look elsewhere. Um, I mean, utopia is elsewhere. It's, uh, literally. So, so that's what's happening. We have to be creative, we have to be open. Um, I'm attached to certain things like Father Freddy, but I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid to look elsewhere. In, dis in discrete and disability, you know, critical disability studies. So I'm fond of making new friends in other places. That's, I think that's what's happening. Um, and then, Charles Mills is a big person to go to. somebody who didn't have the training, who didn't have the background. So for example, um, trying to get a job for normal people, you can't, you, can't just, you can't just submit an application to something that you didn't have quote unquote expertise and you'll never get that job. You'll never make a job in it. And so on, on, on some level, we can call it an amateur there, but in fact, um, their claim is a claim to expertise for her. You know, through other means, through the back door, perhaps, because she's having a hard time going through the front door. Right? She's having a hard time going through the front door. So they have to construct her as an expert in other ways, such as a business person. Right? So that we are introducing an expert businesswoman into education because education is stuck, according to some circles. And so the, the, the normal experts of education need to go away. We need to introduce business and business people and business mindsets. And so, as an outsider to that, amateur scholar who, in some sense, was our figure of, of expert in education, they're gonna introduce a non-expert in that field. The way Saeed is talking about amateur is, in a sense, it's a political, intellectual position one takes towards one's craft, right? The other one that's related to it is the exile. Right? So how can we think of knowledge and through, the pers through the prism, through the prism and optic of the exile? That's related to the amateur to me. Right? Because the exile is the one who is uncomfortable with home, 
whereas like like the amateur, whereas the expert is completely sort of you know sort of at home with their knowledge base, their expertise, and has no problem saying, "What do you know about the Orient Sage? You're not really an area study. So the idea that they would go after him um, on the level of his expertise is that notion of somebody taking expert expert knowledge, right, uh, as a rarefied position in, in academic life, for example. Um, that Saeed is reacting to, because I think you can see his wheels turning, because that's what ox the Occident did to the Orient, through expert eyes, right? through disciplinary eyes, surveyed in more than one way, not just in that, but surveyed literarily, artistically, um, scientifically, the Orient, and through that expert eyes of the, uh, of the Occident, was able to control, right, not only European perceptions of the Orient, but in fact, the Orientals own perceptions of themselves, right? Because who produced the academic intellectual knowledge about the Orient? The Europeans. So what books and other surveys of the Orient could the Orientals read? But the Europeans rendition of it. So in effect, that's what happened in the Orient. And Said is trying to come up with a new theory of the intellectual that hopefully avoids what happened there. And so he's looking at flipping the script. So whereas the intellectual was, was for so long an expert, a person who represents others, a person who in fact represents a community, even Gramsci and all the other quote unquote good guys, let's say, were guilty of this. So Saeed is, is, is working, was working on this. Yeah. So I guess I, I think I'm just worried about the way that it feels to me like it could still get turned to say, well, but the thing about Betsy DeVos is, She's not an expert, right? So fair enough, maybe the framework was really good. She's an expert in business and she'll be awesome, right? And that's why we need her in there. But if they just said, but she's not the expert in this way, and what the value that we get is this kind of freshness, right, that comes in, then because on the one hand, I really like the idea that this idea that we don't need this expertise to be intellectuals, but then on the other hand, in straining the swamp, right? It's just, Get rid of the people who have some experience and right. So how? Well, it's less a label. They can call her whatever they want. Yeah. Right. So it's less a label, and not going back to Gramsci. It's more about the kind of work and social function one fulfills. So for him, for example, Said, part of the intellectual was that the intellectual speaks back to power. Right. So for him, that was a key part of the intellectual as novice, as amateur. And so to the extent that let's say that the boss may not be doing such a thing, then they can call it whatever they want. So it's less a label or a title one assumes and puts on a business card, right? It's more of how the intellectual functions, right? How the intellectual intervenes in situations. And that has, I'm sure we could map out a certain kind of characteristics of this amateur intellectual if we had time, right? We can have the top ten sort of um, tenets or hits of the, of the amateur intellectual. We could do that. We could map it out. So yes, I mean, you can always co-opt the title. Mm -hmm. You can call people whatever you want. But I mean, he lined it out in that book and in other books, which I think he started thinking about in Orientalism, 1979 or so. You can already see the problem of the intellectual. But it's not just that, because the theory of intellectual on the left is an old industry dating at least back to the popular one of Lenin and the Vanguard Party and before that. So we've been working at theories of the intellectual on the left for a long time. Foucault had a problem with it too. So he's joining that cadre of more or less leftist scholars who are trying to rethink, okay, okay so, so you have the communist leader of Vanguard, and that didn't get us out of the problem. Okay, then you have the organic intellectual of Gramsci, well, that didn't get us out of the problem. So it's a long history of people reworking that. So it's not just a title. A, it's part of the history of reworking. But it's also about how does one function as an intelligent. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about um, how, uh, how you characterize uh, post-color blindness. Um, post-color blindness. Within the Albright community, you mentioned it being very clear. But um, I guess within the larger population, how can you notice no other differences between these two eras. What's, what's nice, I suppose, the, the silver lining 
about post color blindness and tell me if I'm if I can cite somebody on that phrase on that term. I'd love it to be something I created, but I don't assume because we come up with ideas. What's nice about post color blind discourse and that's the nice way to call it, by the way, is that it shot colorblind people into realizing what was going on. And it made people who are otherwise using colorblind discourse, they started using race cognizant, race overt discourse. Not in the post colorblind way, and not in the Jim Crow way. They used it in a sort of race cognizant, let's say critical race theorist kind of way. It kind of shocked them into, oh my gosh, what's going on? And they started coming out of their colorblind cocoons. So that's interesting as a byproduct of post-colorblind racialized speech. Is it shot? Because a lot of colorblind people actually pride themselves on being liberal. It's a liberal discourse, really, right? And it shocked them into thinking, oh, this is happening. And they started reacting in a sort of more race cognizant way. So that's one. So that may be a half answer to what you're asking is how is it happening to the, the not all part? Yeah. I think that we'll have to see, but right now I am attaching post colorblindness to the alt right. right? That it is a way for a group of people, and not the obvious torch bearing Charlottesville marchers, Fisher case in Texas, right? Is a post colorblind kind of talk. Of I was victimized. And so it runs the range of people who feel that their whiteness was used against them, right? And, and sort of use sometimes evidence to shore that up and then we talk about the problems of those evidence. And so that's how I'm looking at it right now. It's some new stuff I'm working on. But that's how I'm making sense of it. Is that there's a, a set, a subset of, um, of whites, particularly whites, I suppose this could be beyond whites, but they are arguing that they are victims of affirmative action. And this has been some decades or years in the making. But Trump, I think, opened the door. He kicked it wide open, um, and people went through the door. It's been in the making. Right? And so that sense of the alt-right, for lack of a better root, um, were able to learn the discourse of the left, identity politics, etc., and turned it into white identity politics and say, well, okay, we can't go back to Jim Crow and assert our superiority. That looks racist, right? But we can certainly assert ourselves as a minority, right? That deserves respect. That deserves recognition, etc. So that's how I'm making sense of it for now. We'll see. I don't know how long it's going to last. For example, Trump did a second Trump, right? So I don't know how long this is going to last. Is there a moment? Or is it a movement? We'll see. Kenny. Yeah. And then another question. Um, I have an ill-formed question, so you should feel free to be annoyed uh, by this. But I'm, I'm sure I've heard worse. Yeah, you may have. Maybe uh, not. OK, so I'm trying to figure out within myself. So one of the answers to this desperate cry of white supremacy Right, you say is sort of the need for the intellectual as a non-expert. I think what I heard you say. Did I just hear you? I'm oh, sorry. One of the cries. For sorry. The, the, what the answer at the very end was about the cleaner side. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. you're saying, yeah. I think what I heard you say yes. is that, that one of the answers to the desperate cry of the white oh. supremacist, right, that's happening is the need for the intellectual as non-expert. Okay. Go on, I'll, I'll, I'll flesh it out. Okay, so I guess I'm going back to something you said earlier, which was about how mark, various people are marginalized communities, including women in various disciplines, need to declare themselves as experts in order to be heard. And now I'm trying to think about my practice with children in the classroom, right? Many of them are marginalized, and myself as a woman, right? Because in a discipline where women are not very well represented. And so I'm trying to figure out how to right, resolve this tension, right? Of, Recognizing that in the population of kids I work with, expertise is going to be very important to them for lifting out of the conditions in which they find themselves, um, while simultaneously being sympathetic, right, to the view that you're giving. And I wonder if you have any thoughts at all. So, 
So it's not a silver bullet, right, that we should now just go around thinking of ourselves as non-experts. So it's an offering, and it's a complicated offering because people, dif people from different groups and histories come into the situation differently. So I'm going to relate it to smartness as property, right? Because um, smartness, so I have children, they're ch mixed, mixed children of color, they're multiracial. Uh, my my co-author, Alicia Broderick, is, is, is white, and she has white children, and phenotypically, etc. Um, I don't know if my children are sometimes mistaken for whites, we'll have to see, right? So, so for example, Alicia um, takes to task any teacher that calls her child intelligent because of the idea that smartness is an ideological property, like whiteness was an ideological, so whiteness as property is what we're gesturing to. Right? So we, we wrote this essay, Smartness as Property. And for so long, what marginalized people wanted was to be considered smart, to be part of the smart club, to be intelligent. And it goes back to that sort of sentence from Audre Lorde of, can we use the master's tools right, to dismantle the master's house? which is, has been helpful. And so that's one way of coming at the problem of intelligence and smartness, because marginalized people, sure, we want to be in the smart club, but that reifies sometimes the very problem that was used against us, or whatever us is, right? Right down to right, measuring crania as the symbol of intelligence. Now, we don't do that anymore, because that would be creepy. But we certainly don't, don't have any problems with measuring intelligence in other ways, such as a standardized test. So that's the history we're trying to uh, drag up here, the eugenics, the, the racialized eugenics of intelligence, which relates to the idea of expertise, right? So these are somewhat metaphors or synonyms. Um, and so when Alicia's teachers call her children intelligent, she goes after them. I have children of color, who are my children, these literally my children of color. Um, I can't see myself taking white teachers to task if they call my child smart. That's what you're talking about. So it's not like it's as simple as let's, right, let's, let's not join that club. But I'm trying to trouble it. Right? I'm trying to trouble it. I certainly would like to get in front of you and be looked at as an, as an expert. Not the least of which is on race, Marxism, and, and, and whiteness. I think I have some rights of expertise there. And so I think that that's one level of talking about this. But he's talking about an orientation to knowledge. Yeah, and how knowledge is a relationship. And the more we talk about experts of knowledge through examples of Orientalism and non-expert knowledge as a way to sort of uh, to, to sort of discredit others, as he was discredited by other Orientalists. Well, you know, you're not an expert. I think that's what he's trying to talk about. The more we can see knowledge as relational, the more we can see knowledge as ideological, the more we can see knowledge as involved in certain ideological work, the more he wants us to consider the history of how knowledge has been used through colonialism and imperialism as a problem. So he's searching for another way into knowledge. And that's what he's calling amateurism, or the novice, or the new And as long as we can go into it in that spirit, right, which is not the idea that, oh, I'm now there. <laughs> you know, it's a sort of vacillation, and we're just constantly reminding ourselves, as you got it and reminded yourself of your stories. I think that that's what he's trying to talk about. And so, um, it's not, a disclaimer that you can't have expertise. But what does it mean to have an orientation to knowledge as a relational project of experts and non-experts? Because that we call that an edu education, by the way, we call that competence. Cultural competencies, for example. And who is often the victim of that literature? Who needs to be taught competencies? What are kids? Because you're thinking of expertise about you're thinking of competence in a particular way, right? That they don't have that often gets racially unnamed of what that cultural competence is, such as, I, you know, just to pick an example, we've already talked about this idea of silence and, you know, and sitting in your chair and that kind of thing. But they need to be taught to be in their chair, for example. Or another presenter talked about giving their children, their students, the permission to be loud, and that that was okay. 
Oh, that was you. There you go. And so, in education, we call it competence. Right? You might as well call that expertise. So, apparently, black children are not experts in certain cultural ways. So, we need to teach them. But things like that is what we're talking about. So, how can they be looked at as um, experts in their own right? Because it's right. It's their own culture. They know. They are experts at. But I, I guess what Sayyid is asking is to resist the temptation, right? To then construct them as experts and therefore intelligent. Because that really leaves some other people out as unintelligent, as unexpert. It's just that, oh, we're now on the right side of that point. Um, I'm wondering if I can ask you to flesh out in more detail the parallel that you're trying to draw between the amateur and the exile. Um, so you were saying, yeah. right, that they do a similar sort of work, and I'm trying to make sense of what that would mean for myself as an intellectual. And I see the two positions very differently. Yes. So I think about my experiences coming into academic philosophy as an amateur. Um, and I think part of what's involved in being an amateur and entering a discipline is that you accord some sort of legitimacy to the discipline and the norms of the discipline, right? Um, so you take the rules as having some sort of normative authority over you in order to right, really get into the discipline. And I think of what it might be like to think of myself as an exile. Uh, sometimes I feel like I have this experience being yes. um, you know, a queer Arab woman in philosophy. And I think my speaking position is really different because it's a sort of cynical position. Uh, so it's a position that sort of arrived at through trial by fire, right? And I wonder if the parallel really holds. Um, so in some ways, having gone through this experience, I look back at amateur me, and there's some sort of resonance there, where I'm now able to make sense of certain of the experiences that I had, and at the time there was some sort of hermeneutical injustice happening, where I couldn't understand uh, why I wasn't uh, intelligible to certain people in certain ways in the past. But I also wonder if that the knowledge that I have now blocks me from seeing my past self in certain ways. Um, because I have been through the discipline, I'm sort of unalterably changed by having gone through that experience. So there's now a perhaps a gap I don't know how wide uh, to my past self, and I'm wondering how to how to navigate the space between those two speaking positions. Okay. Um, it's wonderful to hear. In fact. As you're saying, they may not be compatible. As you were describing it, they're completely compatible in the way I was making sense, right. not just of what you're saying, but what I understand Saeed to be saying, and what the literature on exile says. Right. Because he's not the only one. Like Ray Chow writes about it, Pony Baba. It's uh, a trope that people have gotten something out of in the post-colonial analysis or literature. Right? And so I, I believe that they are Quite compatible, even as you were saying, because this idea of the gap of the previous you now sort of been disciplined into philosophy and has been and, and the, the you has been transformed, and you don't know how to look at the previous you. That's exactly what I actually presented. Who was that yesterday, right? Janice, I presented yesterday at Seattle U on the exile is exactly that. There's no homecoming for you. Right. You can't go back to that hermeneutic self of before. Right. But to Saeed, Okay, to say he's not saying let's. Part of it, he's trying to recognize that this is happening to people. A, that's A. And it's not just these examples in academic halls, but war and displacement, dispossession at the level of nations in Syria, for example. Um, his example is Palestine to Israel, that kind of situation. But it happens in countries of how, for example, Native Americans are exiles on their own land here. It happens in cities as they get gentrified. People are pushed out. Right? And so that's, it happens on multiple levels. It happens in families. I talked about white, I talked about whites who need to go into exile yesterday, even from their own families sometimes. And that, that this doesn't have to be grieved. But that exile, to the extent that it's real, refugees, etc., we can take those examples of those larger global events and kind of filter them down into our own personal lives also. So one, to say one can choose exile. And before we go down the road of, oh, this is about individuals, no, 
Okay? This is an institutional impact <coughs> social analysis. But I suppose people can as individuals choose, but that's not my interest in its uh, own. Uh, James Joyce did it, and etc. So I think that that's, that is the amateur, because to be an exile is in a sense a homeless, a state of homelessness. And I know homelessness is, is serious in the community, as Thomas said, because that's where I'm from. But we share that in common, so I don't want to you know, minimize material uh, indigence of some people. Um, but in the post-colonial <coughs> literature, the literature on exile, it, it is about disrupting home. Because home has been disrupted. Right? But to the extent that that's happened to people in real ways, how can we learn that as a life worth living? Despite the break in their history, that is not that we expect the post-colonial to sit in the corner and grieve even more, but that you find happiness in that state of disruption. Because simply put, that's what human striving is about. So how can we take those lessons of the exile such that you are an academic exile? I've had my own you know, travel among the disciplines myself. I assume everybody here changed majors at least once. So I think it's that, that sense that you're, you're feeling. But the exile would then look at the old you as, in a sense, a, it's an impossible place to return to. But that's not a grievable situation for you. That belonging, I talked about belonging yesterday, that belonging that we want to feel in our discipline is a double edge. We want to make it our home. But we know that sometimes, A, for some people, home is a violent place. Colonialism makes somebody else's home their own, right? And the sense of belonging, belonging is also uh, a possession. Like, slaves belong to masters, right? Colonies belong to the colonizers. So belonging is disruptive, but it doesn't prevent me from wanting it. It's just that I have a careless love affair with belonging and home. And so I guess what I'm asking, what I'm, how I'm thinking about it, I think they are very good. They might not be the same, but I think it's that spirit of looking at your situation in that open way. Right. I mean, I guess where I'm sensing a disanalogy, and maybe I'm not conceptualizing this in the right way, is it seems to me like when you're an amateur, uh, you're not indoctrinated yet. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, but part of being the exile is that once you've entered the system, there's a sense in which you take it with you forever. Uh, your where mark, the amateur, right, where the amateur is still supposing that they're not in the process yet of entering, um, in some sense outside, yeah. uh, whereas the exile, even when you try and right, uh, sure. extirpate yourself from the system, you always take part of it with sure. you after that. He uh, talks about that as fixing. Right. Right? And that the exile and the amateur are against the fixing propensity of Western knowledge, for example. You've been fixed by the discipline. We've been fixed in the essentials, enlightenment discourses, etc. Yes. Yeah. You're right. Right. I think so it's thing to think about. Like, but he's trying right. to get us to, as we enter our disciplines, to not let it fix us. Right. It might fix you anyway, yeah. because that's what it wants to do. But if you take the amateur's perspective, the exile's perspective, you're in a sense resisting it all along. Right? So the institution may want to do its work on you. That doesn't leave you without choices. You know, so what um, mindset, what orientation do I enter philosophy? What orientation? I mean, I think I earlier signaled that I, I'm not a paradigmatic thinker. I, I have intellectual seasons, maybe almost. The seasons, and I, I talk about it as uh, it's it's these uh, seasons with their homes, but I never relax enough to put my feet up on the couch. Right? It's that sense of the exile and the amateur that resists the institutional fixing of us, in spite of it trying to do that. And it strikes me that maybe you're, you're it sounds to me like you're trying to do that yourself, but but you took it with you. But here's the rub: as much as it marked you and changed you, you changed it in your small way as well. You didn't leave it unmarked. 
and you're here, you're talking, and these are other philosophers. And so you leave it marked as well. So the marking goes both ways, not equal. I think I will amateurly disrupt. <laughs> no, but uh, thank you very much.